You know, uh, right before service, I was talking to my brother Lou over there, and uh, he mentioned first responders. And I'll be honest with you, and when I was a cop, which I was a cop many years ago, uh, I was a police officer for 14 years, and after a couple of injuries, I had to leave the force. But, you know, we, uh, and I see fellow law enforcement here, you know, we, we tackled, you know, robbers. We, we joined the SWAT team as we entered into drug dealers' houses. I mean, we arrested murderers and child molesters, but nothing, nothing is as nerve-wracking as standing in front of people and talking. <laughs> I'd rather be out there chasing people at 120, right, Aaron? Yeah, he agrees. You know, you'd rather do that than be out there 20, 120 miles an hour than to stand here in front of you. Whew! But we take a deep breath and let it be done for God's glory, right? Yeah. Come on. Now, I'm going to need your help today, okay? I don't want to just be the only one up here talking. I expect you guys to say, hey, man, glory to God, praise the Lord, all that good stuff, all right? So help me out. Amen. I heard one already. So if you've been coming here for a couple of weeks or a few weeks, you know that Pastor Randy has been preaching for several weeks on the topic of breakthrough. And it is a magnificent, magnificent uh, topic because we need breakthrough in our lives. Amen. Amen. And, and one of the things uh, that he was talking about with breakthrough, you know, had to do with surrender you know, and consecration. So, so I wanted to piggyback from what he was talking about that. But let me just give you a real quick review and only a couple of sentences of what he was preaching about in the last few weeks. Pastor Randy said that we need to be separate from the world, that we must be different. Do you agree with that statement? Yeah. Amen. We must. Amen. Well, look around the churches in the United States. We'll talk about that later. He also said that it is unfortunate that some Christ followers today, they look just like the rest of the world. Do you agree with that statement? Yeah. Now, now, when I talk about the church today, please know I'm not referring to everyday church. I'm referring to the church as we know it in the United States, okay? So I want to make sure I say that up front. He also mentioned that our desires should be to go after God and not after the things of the world. He asked us questions like, what in your life sets you apart from the world? Is there anything in your life that sets you apart from the world? Or when somebody has an exchange with you, they leave as empty as they came when they first met you. Right. I'm not saying that you must preach to everybody the gospel and the road of salvation through the book of Romans every time you meet somebody. Right. But what I'm saying, is there anything in your life that you can truly see and others can see that will set you apart from others? Another good question that Pastor brought is, what are we doing every day to be more like God instead of being more like the world? He also mentioned things like, we all want to see the move of God. Who wants to see the move of God? Yeah. Now, let me tell you, uh, last week, last week I was doing security in the back door, so I was not in here, but uh, they put a little tablet back there with the service, and I saw a massive move of God going on in here last night, last week. Amen? I mean, we love that, don't we? And you know, the thing is that a lot of times we don't think about it until we see that kind of move, but God is here. He is present right here, right now. I mean, it doesn't matter if you feel him or not. He is right here and he's ready to work in your life. So pastor spoke about that and he spoke about how we want to see breakthrough. But he also asked the question, it says, what are we doing to get this kind of breakthrough? Now, as I, as I prepared this and as I get ready to speak, remember, salvation is not by works. Amen. It is by the grace of God. But we must learn to come to him. We must learn to surrender the good, the bad, the ugly to him so that he can work in our lives. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Today we're going to talk about total surrender. And uh, I know I say this all the time, but I really think I'm going to be here for a while today. So get ready. Is that okay, Pastor? Can I have two hours? Whoa, somebody didn't like that back there. Nancy. Uh, anyway. Hey, I say that all the time and I never do two hours, do I? Come on. I know. She says, praise God. So... Who's been reading the Bible here for, for a while? Come on, let me see some hands, come on. Do you ever see in the scriptures the amazing work of the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts? Amen? Amen? Yes. Do you ever ask yourself, why then, not now? I mean, think about it. The apostles were walking and their shadow was healing people. I mean, could you imagine you're going to Paddock Mall in Ocala, you're shopping your little bag, and somebody goes by you in a wheelchair. Woo! Yeah, they jump up and start dancing. That's what we saw in the book of Acts, as crazy as you may think that sounds. Why? Think about that for a minute. Just, just, just let it simmer. Let it simmer. Why? Hmm. 
I've been a Christian for a while, and I have, by the grace of God, went to a couple countries in the early 2000s to do missions work. I've been in Jamaica, Mexico, Honduras, and El Salvador. And let me tell you something. I know God is real. I have seen miracles with my own eyes. I saw a deaf man receive his, his hearing. I mean, one minute he's deaf, we lay hands on him, and one minute he can hear everything going on. I saw a man in a wheelchair standing up. I mean, come on, that's the same God we're talking about today. We were in a service at a really poor neighborhood, and this guy comes up to me, and he's saying, I need healing, my back. And I'm thinking, standing right there, I've had two back surgeries, and for many years of my life, I suffer from pain, okay? So this guy's asking me for a miracle that I don't even have. So I was like, okay. But he says, my back, my back, my back. We got together, we lay hands on him, and he was healed. And you know what he did? Just like in the Bible, he ran to all the neighborhood that we were at and started telling people what God had done. And all of a sudden, we had a line of people praying, you know, asking for prayer. So has God changed? Exactly. So we see all these miracles happening. And why is it that we see it happening when we go to other countries? I mean, think about that. Not yes, I understand we need that. We need that special anointing when we go to other countries, okay? Because we are, I mean, we're, they're expecting. I remember the first time I went to Mexico, the people we spoke to, they told us, we want you to pray for this guy in the wheelchair because he's expecting because the Americans are here. I mean, wow, God has not changed, but we have. When I look at the Western church, and again, this is not to criticize anybody specifically, but I see that just that fire, that passion in our hearts is not there in many churches. And I thank God for this church, Pastor, because we're seeing the work of God. Amen. Amen. But it's, it, it, just, it just makes me sad to see what's going on in so many churches. You know, and what is it? What is it? I think it's surrender. We are just areas in our lives that we don't give up. There are things in our lives that we just don't give up. But God, in His grace, in His love, in His mercy, wants you to give everything to Him. Amen? Amen. Now, I'm going to read some scriptures, and I don't have nothing on the, on the screen because, again, I did it again. I forgot to send him scriptures. Last time I spoke, I forgot to send him scriptures again. So, Mike, uh, it's okay, right? Amen. So here we go. Matthew 16, 24 and 25, it says, Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone wishes to come after me, he must what? Come on. Okay, that, that's, that's coming, but it first says deny. Deny, okay? Deny yourself. Take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Now notice, he says we must deny ourselves. Did you hear that emphatically right there? You must. See, he didn't say, hey guys, I think you should deny yourself, you know? It's probably going to be okay. No, 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 no. He says you must deny yourself. What do I have to deny? What's going on? Really, Lord, what do you want me to deny? We're going to talk about that. So denial in the New Testament is the intentional disassociation from relationship with a particular person. I looked that online. I looked it up. <laughs> I don't come up with big words. If you know me, you know I don't come up with big words, okay? You know, I have to look them up online. This is what Peter did. When Jesus was arrested and Peter denied Jesus, okay, he was trying to separate himself from Christ. Therefore, self-denial is the intentional disowning of the self or stepping away from a relationship where the self is primary. You ever heard that saying, me, myself, and I? I love me, myself, and I. That's us being selfish. Me, myself, and I come first. It is me who come first, not you. I must take care of myself. I must love myself. Now listen, all those, all those things are good to love yourself, to, to take care of yourself, but in the proper context of the gospel. So following Christ means disowning the self and giving your allegiance to him. 100%. Listen, I'm not getting religious. He wants your job. He wants your family. He wants your kids. He wants your wife. He wants your money. He wants your car, your house. He does. But not because he's going to take it away from you, but because he's going to bless it. Amen. So Luke 14, 33 says, So therefore, any one of you who does not renounce or forsake all that he has cannot be my disciple. I looked it up also. The word forsake means literally to say goodbye to, 
by departing or dismissing, to renounce, to bid farewell, to forsake, to leave. That's what it means to forsake everything and to come to Christ. I'm bringing this message to you today to encourage you that we have a God who loves you. We have a God who wants the best for us. But sometimes we are the ones who get in the way of all his blessing and all his power. Amen. Now, I'm going to give you a couple of definitions and then we'll move on. Surrender, okay, is to cease resistance to an enemy or an opponent. Simple, right? You, you hear about surrender when somebody gets robbed. Hey, I give it all. You know, I surrender. Or the enemy defeats another army. They surrender. That's part of that. Now, the Bible definition of surrender is to yield to the power of another. Now, I have known of people in the past who they get up in the morning and they even ask God, should I put my right sock on first or my left? <laughs> hey, you think I'm kidding. I, I knew a guy like this. Okay, do I wear the brown pants or the white ones? Should I brush my teeth today? You know, there are some things that God doesn't want you to ask him. Amen? You don't have to sit there and say, should I breathe now, Lord? <gasps> I'm waiting for you to tell me what to do. <laughs> it's okay that you seek the will of God. But there's some things that are, okay, already explained that you have the authority and the power to take care of that. But there's things in our lives that we truly need to know the will of God. And you know what? I'm going to give you a top secret. Nobody has ever heard this before. The word of God has his will. Ha! You guys knew that, right? Come on. Or oh, am I the only one who knew of that? I'm so smart. I mean, his will, his will is presented in his word. You want to know God? You want to know what he likes? You want to know what he hates? You want to know what he wants for you? It's right there in the scriptures. That's why we got to get familiar with the word of God. Amen. So when you surrender, you yield your power to him. You yield that power to another. You give or deliver up your possession, anything. That's total surrender. Now, if you don't give up everything, you have not surrendered to the Lord. And we're going to touch on this a few more minutes, but let's be honest. Some of us, and God's been breaking me for a few weeks. Some of us just let God into our house. But no, 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 don't go into that bedroom. I don't, I, I don't know. Lord, you can have the master bedroom, you can have the bathroom, you can have the living room, but, but not, not my man cave. Uh -uh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Not my man cave. Because that's where we hide. That's where we have our addictions, okay? That's where we have our shame, our embarrassment, our fear. And we let God into our lives, but we don't let him in all the way. And you're not going to have victory until you say, that's it, I surrender and I surrender all to you. You have to. We have to. You got to take, you got to do whatever it takes. Whatever it takes. Amen. Hey, you know, God just put that in my mind right now. It's not even in my notes. You remember a long time, quite a few years ago, maybe more than 10 years ago, Kirk Cameron had that movie Fireproof, I think it was. You remember how he was having issues with the computer, right? And what did he do with the computer? He took it outside and he beat it to death with the baseball bat, didn't he? You see what he was doing? He was recognizing the failure in his life. And he knew that as long as he had that computer at home, he was being tempted. So he took that, just like the Bible says, he separated himself from it. He destroyed it. He said, goodbye, I'm done with you because I don't need you in my life. Are you willing to do that? Amen. Woo! Come on. Oh, some people just got real quiet in here. <laughs> now, now we're meddling, right? That's how they say. Now we're meddling. Uh, woo! Hey, hey. Considering that I speak Spanish, you know, those big words are, hey, yeah, <laughs> praise the Lord. So anyway, so remember, to surrender is to give up completely, but you also give him, the conqueror, the authority over you. Now, Matthew 10, 37, and all the scriptures, when you hear about them, it's like, wow, you know, that, that's pretty hard stuff. Matthew 10, 37 says, whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Now, again, this verse doesn't mean you got to hate your parents. Amen. This verse doesn't mean you got to hate your wife. Hey, some of you don't think about leaving your family just because I'm preaching this stuff. OK. Oh, he said we, we should. No, no, no. That's not what he's talking about. OK. This is not about renouncing your family. It's renouncing yourself. So something really interesting that I found about this verse when I looked it up in the Greek. It says whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. 
That Greek word that he uses there for love is phileo. Okay, it's not agape or any other ones, phileo. Okay, and if you know the Bible a little bit, phileo means to be a friend of, to be fond to an individual or an object, or to have affection for. See, Jesus is saying, if you have affection for your mother or your father more than me, then you don't belong to me. And you can apply that to anything in your life. Jesus is saying, if you have affection more for your computer than you do for me, you're not in the kingdom of God. Amen? Amen. Ooh, did that hurt somebody? Ow! Come on. You know? Hey, I'll tell you one thing, and you can ask Pastor Randy. I talked to him or my wife. When I, when I bring a message, it's because God has been dealing with me for months, years, whatever. And, and, and to me, I got to do it. It's like a seal. You know, I want to seal this, you know? And, and because I know that we all are in this together. We all go through, uh, through issues in our life. So Jesus is saying that if your affection or your attention is towards others, you're not surrounded to him. Now, I love the way the Apostle Paul p- puts it in Philippians 3, 7, and 8. He says, whatever gain I had, I count it as loss. For the sake of Christ, indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. Any King James people over here? That's, that's scripture in the King James. It says, I count it all dung. <laughs> dung. Okay, I won't say the American word for that, but he counts it all dung, everything. And now think about the Apostle Paul. He was a man of authority. He had letters from the rulers of those times to go and arrest of those who called themselves of the way, the Christians. He had the authority to throw you in jail. Okay, that's the Apostle Paul, a powerful man. But he had an encounter, hallelujah, with the Most High God, and he surrendered all to him. That's why he can say this, that I may gain Christ. Do you want to gain Christ? Come on, do you want to gain Christ? Amen, hallelujah. Now, listen, I understand most of us probably here are saved. Okay, you come to Christ, you come to the knowledge of Jesus Christ, you receive the gospel of salvation. You know what? You are born again, your spirit, you know, you're sealed in the Holy Spirit of promise, you are going to heaven, but what happens is you're not living in victory. And that's why God's calling you to total surrender, so that you can have that victory. Paul said, I count, I consider everything, everything, but the loss for the excellency of the knowledge, the deeper, more perfect and enlarge knowledge of Christ. Man, that's deep. Praise God. Think about this. The same God that raised Jesus from the dead looked at creation one day, and he said, you're mine. He chose you. He chose you. Think about I mean, think about that. That right there, we should just pause here for like the next hour and meditate on that. Wow. I mean, I mean, I know we know those scriptures, right? We know the word of God, but we don't think and meditate. Like it says in the book of Joshua, we don't meditate on those scriptures. That God, the creator of the universe, and this universe is so big that there's even new planets, constellations, and galaxies they're finding now. And he said, you're mine. Wow. Man, so what he wants for you is to live in His glory. And we must surrender it all to Him. Hallelujah. Now, why do we have issues with surrender? You remember that word, me, myself, and I? That's our big problem. You see, we are triune beings, okay? You are a spirit, you have a soul, and you have a body. When you came to Christ, your spirit was saved and sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise. But you still have a soul, and guess what? You still have a flesh. Your soul is your mind, your will, and your emotions. So you see, your soul and your flesh is not saved. (laughs) Come on, somebody. It's true. You must be saving your soul, okay, your mind, your will, your emotions every single day until Jesus calls you home. That's called sanctification, okay? And we're going to cover that too. So what happens is our sinful nature, our soul, you know, our flesh gets in our way. We give in to temptation too much. We get bound by temptation, by sin, by whatever it may be that is holding you back. It influences you. But what happens is that when, this is part of consecration. And if you haven't figured out, you know, surrender 
consecration, holiness, it all comes together the same thing. I mean, when you look in John chapter 10, I mean, sorry, John chapter 13, when Jesus is about to wash the disciples' feet, and I'm not going to read the whole thing for time's sake, but I shared this with the men one time when we were back there by the fire. When Jesus got ready to wash the disciples' feet, what did Peter say? Uh-uh, not my feet. You know, you're, you know. Why? Because, I mean, Peter's like, oh, no, you're too holy, Lord. And, and no, you're not going to, but what did Jesus say? Not, you know, if I don't wash your feet, right? You're not part of the kingdom of God. So Peter says, not only my feet, my whole body. But there's something really powerful that Jesus said at the end there. And this is why we need consecration. This is why we need daily surrender. He says to Peter, he who has bathed, okay, listen to this. He who has bathed needs only to wash his feet. Otherwise, he's completely clean. You see, when you walk in this world, you're already clean. You're blood-bought, sanctified, holy, separated, Woo, amen. But your feet get dirty when you walk in this world. And that's why God is saying that's part of consecration. That's part of a surrender that you daily get your feet washed. Amen. We need to do that to stay strong in the Lord. Listen, God is not asking for perfection. <laughs> if he was asking for perfection, none of us be here today. None of us. All right? He's not asking for perfection, but he's asking for surrender. He's asking for surrender. And surrender is us cooperating with the Holy Spirit. That's what surrender is. See, God says, no, 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 don't do it that way. Do it this way. And we're like, hmm, okay. And you know what? You just stepped into the will of God. That's what surrender is all about. Now, he knows your addiction. So why are you hiding them from him? He knows what trips you up. Why are you hiding it from him? He's right there. He sees every bit of your life. So why hide it from him? It is so refreshing when you can come to God with the good, the bad, and the ugly. Amen. And just say, Lord, here I am. Now cleanse me. Help me. Guide me. And the grace of God will do that. And we'll cover that in a few minutes. Now, we said earlier, we want to see the move of God. We want to see revival like never before. We want to see so much more. But it all starts right here. It all starts right here. And by the way, I'm not talking about judging. Well, I'm talking about it in the Bible sense. Okay, we are to care for each other. If your brother sins, you need to do something about that. Do you know that? Yeah. yeah. When was the last time anybody in the church came up to you and said, Hey, how are you doing this week? Huh? What did you, did, you, did you do something this week that compromised your faith? Come on, let's talk. Come on, come on. I think people would turn around, right? Whoa, whoa, you, you want to get into my business? Yeah. Yeah, because you're my brother. You're my sister. And you are a reflection of the image of God. I want to know what's going on in your life. And that's the problem is we don't share with each other. That's why I love this men Bible studies, women Bible studies, because we need each other as iron sharpens iron. Amen. Amen. All right. So we talked about total surrender. And, you know, total and absolute surrender is the key to unlocking God's power in your life. Now, think about that for a minute. It's the key to unlocking God's power in your life. Absolute surrender is the response of those who have been saved from their own death and destruction through the sacrifice of Christ Jesus on the cross. Absolute surrender is the proof of authentic worship. Whew. To come before God, to worship Him. Absolute surrender before Him. Now, when I was researching this topic, I found a comment that I really, really liked. It's, this is not my words. You, you'll be able to tell by the language, but, uh, but it's something very powerful. He said, he was talking about Romans chapter 12, what we're going to quote in a minute. He said, the Apostle Paul argued in the first 11 chapters of Romans, leading up to chapter 12, that when a person fully recognizes and appreciates the incredible favor bestowed upon them through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, the appropriate response is complete submission to the will and power of the Lord. And he goes on saying, this decision is not one that comes without conditions or demands. In fact, choosing to walk in absolute surrender is a lofty choice. It requires a total life commitment to the Lord. 
and not to the ways of this world. It offers up every part of oneself as a living and holy sacrifice. The life of the surrendered man or woman of God looks noticeable different. Think about that. Looks noticeable different in every aspect, especially regarding the way in which they think. Absolute surrender demands a different way of thinking and a different way of seeing. Hallelujah. That's powerful. Those words are powerful. Now let's read Romans 12, which he was talking about. And you've heard the scripture many times from the pulpit before. Romans 12, 1 and 2 says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you what? Say it loud, that you what? That's an act of the will. You know that? God didn't make you do that. You presented yourself before him. A living sacrifice. Holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed. Ah, conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That you may prove what is good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. When the decision is made to wholly surrender heart, soul, and mind to the ways of Christ, you will receive a great reward. You will know God's perfect will for you. That's powerful, guys. Whew, that's powerful. I'm going to skip a little bit because I realize I don't have two hours like I thought I did. <laughs> now, one of the questions we need to ask ourselves is, do you really want this for your life? Let's be honest. Some people are not ready. Some people will walk out of here today and they don't care about surrendering to God. Oh, I'm too young or I've been through this before, or I just don't quite understand. But you know what? If you get a hold of this, you will be living in God's perfect will, which is perfect, good, and pleasing. Or, like I said, you can ignore it, and you can live according to your will. See, that's what I call the battle of the wills, okay? You will always have that battle in your life because you're made out of flesh, and you got a soul, mind, will, and emotions. But why want God's will in my life? What about you? Ooh, 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 come on, let's say that again. All right, hey, man, come on. Who wants God's will in your life? Amen. That's a little bit better. Amen. Hallelujah. So you know Matthew 6, 33, very famous scripture. What does it say? Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And I like how a pastor I used to know used to say, when he said his righteousness, he said his way of doing things. Powerful. His way. You remember when Jesus said, I only do what the Father does? I only speak what the Father speaks? That's what he wants out of us. Now, moving right along, Hebrews 12, 1 and 2 is a very powerful scripture. And it says, therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that is set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Now, that's very important. Remember, he says, it says, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily ensnares us. See, when the runners back then in the Coliseum days and, 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 and the Olympic days when they started, when the runners ran, they got rid of everything that got in the way because they wanted to run a clean race and they wanted to win. Amen. We need to realize that there are things in your way right now that are stopping you from God's glory. There's things that you need to get rid of that will only come when you totally surrender everything to Christ. And that's what we're talking about, total surrender. Every weight, you need to get rid of that. Any burden, anything that is unnecessary, anything that gets on your way, any sin that so easily traps you and holds you back. Now, this is sanctification. This is surrender. This is holiness, okay? Now, holiness, listen. A lot of people get trapped with that word holiness. Oh, that, that word holiness means you can't do this, you can't dress like that. You, you know. Listen, holiness is, is not just a, about moral perfection, which that's great, that you, your morality should change in the will of God, but it's also, you know, to be separated, to be called out, to set aside for a specific use. And so are you today. You are set aside. You're holy. Now listen, I don't care what you did this morning. You're holy. Did you get me? That's what the Bible says. I don't say that. It's in the scriptures. So that's something to keep in your mind. See, God is saying, be like me. Be unique. Amen? Come on, we only got 30 pages to go. <laughs> How much time do I have, sweetheart? That's all right. We got plenty of time. Right, Pastor? Yeah? Okay. Thank you. Now, let's talk about the biblical idea of consecration, okay? 
Consecration is to take something that is ordinary and unclean, purify it, set it aside for special use. That's what he's done with us. This is what the Lord wants from us. He's asking you and I to be willing, see, willing to give ourselves that sacrifice, okay? Willing to give ourselves completely to him and to allow him to take us ordinary, sinful people and turning us into the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. True saints, people who will reflect the image of God. And this is why surrender needs to be a daily thing because yesterday is gone and tomorrow's not here. Every day to wake up in the morning, recognize who is God. Recognize He is Lord and you are not. Recognize that you need help in every area of your life. Recognize that you're going to, you know, today you're going to do things and you want Him to be there, not only to protect you, but to guide you. So now this is the grace of God that He took on clean people and He sanctified us and He made us just like Him. But we still get in our way. Man, woo, I'm going to read you scripture. I, I, I was really battling with this scripture because it's got mainly to do with adultery. But, but it really, you know, the Lord just kept telling me, you know, to put this in here. So I, as we read it, I understand that he was talking about adultery, okay? But the teaching is so powerful that it really changes our lives. And I'm talking about Matthew 5, 27 through 30. He says, you have heard that it was said, by those of old, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that whosoever looks at a woman for lo to lust for her has already committed adultery in, her, in his heart. He says, if your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. Ouch. And cast it out from you. For it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. Amen. And he says, and if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it off. For it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. So I read the scripture and I said, yeah, I understand it has to do with adultery. But, but there's such a powerful teaching here that I hope this, this, this hits you like it hit me. So, so amazing. Why is he talking about the, the eye and the right hand? Why not the left hand? OK, why not the eyes? So I did a little bit of study and Luke eleven thirty four 34 through 36. It says the lamp of the body. It's your eye. You heard that before, right? The lamp of your body is your eye. Therefore, when your eye is good, your whole body is full of light. But when your eye is bad, your body also is full of darkness. Therefore, take heed that the light which is in you is not darkness. If then your whole body is full of light, having no part dark, the whole body will be full of light. And as when the bright shining of a lamp gives you light. As we can see here in the Bible, the eye is a window to the soul. Okay, now there's a lot more scriptures, but because of time, I didn't want to put them all in here. But your eye is something that you capture things with. Okay, it gets your attention. You see things. Things come into it. It's like a computer, okay? It's reading everything around. Oh, look at the shirt he's wearing. Oh, she's got glasses. Oh, that's, you know, that's your eyes. The windows to your soul. That which you pay attention to is extremely important in your life. So he's telling you, he's saying, a member of your body that causes you to pay attention or to something. He says, you know, that if, so, if it's bad, we need to cast it out. But let me continue reading here. Let's talk about the right hand. This was the one that floored me. How many times in the Bible we have the right hand? In the Bible, 166 times it refers to the word right hand. So it is no accident that Jesus chose those words that day. God inspired the prophet Isaiah to say, for I, the Lord your God, hold your right hand. It is I who say to you, fear not, for I am the one who helps you. That's Isaiah chapter 41, 13. Then in Luke 20, 42, it says, The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. See, in the Bible, the right hand is a position of authority. You heard that in the Bible says Jesus is seated where? At the right hand of the Father. That is authority. OK, he's got all authority. So that's what it's telling us. Now look at Mark 16, 19. It says, so then the Lord Jesus, after he had spoken to them, was taken up in heaven and sat down where? At the right hand of God. Now it is evident that in the scriptures, right hand is symbolic of having authority and power. Now, so when the Bible says, if your right eye 
causes you to sin, gouge it out. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you. It's not telling you that we must walk around here with one eye and one hand. I mean, I guarantee you our membership will drop like crazy if we start cutting hands when you come in here. It's like, oh, let me cut your right hand. What? <laughs> but, oh, this is powerful. You ready for this? Come on, you ready for this? Yeah. All right. It's saying that that which you pay attention to, that which you pay attention to, that which you allow into your life through your gates, that which you look at, at intently into, whatsoever, remember the right hand power, whatsoever has power or lordship over you, cast it out. Whatever. That which you have allowed to have authority over your decision, cast it out. Whatever it may be. Now here's what you got to think about your own life. What in your life have you given authority to? What in your life have you given the power to rule you? And you say, no, it doesn't rule me. Oh, really? Let me have your phone for a couple of days. <laughs> oh, no volunteers? <laughs> let, let, let's cancel all your social media. Whoa, you're meddling, buddy. <laughs> it's real. It's real, guys. We live a life today that we are so distracted. And I'm not just picking on social media, okay? The world. Let's be honest. You got sports. You got, you got sports 24-7, even if it's not in season. Oh, you got soap operas. I don't know about you. Some people do that. Okay? You got crime shows, which I like, by the way. You know? So I, I'm just human. We have social media. How many times have you lost yourself on Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, TikTok? <gasps> so many of them. How many times you grab that phone? I'm looking at the young people because I know what's going on. How many times you grab that phone and you say to yourself, I'm just going to check it for five minutes. Six hours later. <laughs> right? 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 Come on. I agree. No. Oh, him. Okay. Hey. <laughs> now, 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 now. Are cell phones evil? No. I mean, you can, you can use the cell phone to send messages, right? You can use the cell phone to send somebody a scripture. You can use the cell phone to read the Bible. Yeah. Oh, but you can use the cell phone for some evil stuff too. Yeah, right. This is where surrender comes in. You see, and again, I, I'm, I'm trying not to meddle, but I must. <laughs> if your cell phone causes you to sin, cut it off. Cast it out. You know, let me tell you something. I grew up, anybody who's here more than 40 years old, 45 years old, we didn't have phones when we grew up, right? We had a phone in the house, and when we came home at 5, 6, or 7 o'clock at night, whenever it was, if anybody called and left a message, we would find out. And then much later on in the, I don't know, 80s, I guess, or 70s, when the answer machine came in, you come home and boop, you you check your answer machine. Oh, but now, oh, oh, now, oh, man, we are so plugged in. So, again, I'm not picking on the phone, but it's just so easy to pick on the phone. Do whatever it takes for you to separate yourself from that evil, regardless of what it is. And that's why you gotta self-examine what it is in your life and you need to cut it off. Do whatever it takes and do it on purpose. See, God called you to victory, but as long as you live a distracted life, you won't have it. Listen, you're still going to heaven. You are, okay? If you're saved, sanctified, bought by the blood of Jesus, and he is your Lord and Savior, you're going to heaven. But are you living a life of victory? That's the whole point. That's what surrender is all about. So whatever you got in your life, amen. Whatever you have in your life, whatever you're paying attention to, whatever in our lives are we allowing to lord over us, we must make the decision to fully reject it and cast it off. Amen? Man. On the way out, we're going to have a basket. We want you all to drop your cell phones and your computers. <laughs> Whew. Yeah, I bet you we wouldn't even get one, I bet you. No, I don't know. Maybe we would. Now, how do we do this? Obviously, we're talking surrender, 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 but how do we do it? How do we do it? I mean, do, do I just, you know, you just, what? You ever heard of the grace of God? Come on, have you ever heard of the grace of God? That's where it's all at. That's where it's all at. That's where surrender lies in the grace of God. Let's read this very famous verse. You know it, Paul In 2 Corinthians 12, 9 and 10, he says, And he said to me, My grace is sufficient. You heard that before, right? Anybody here heard that before? Okay. My grace is sufficient to you, 
For my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distress, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, it's when I'm strong. That's grace. But you see, to receive that grace, you have to come to the grace giver. Who's going to play the, the awesome music? Come on. Come join me up here. I loved it. With his grace, everything you need is contained there. I remember Pastor Tim Gilligan from Meadowbrook. He used to always say, grace contains. Okay, I mean, faith releases what grace contains. Everything you need for life and godliness is found in the grace of God. Everything. Everything. But you must release it by faith in your life. Because bottom line is, if you don't daily surrender to the will of God, you are truly surrendering to your own will. Think about that for a minute. You have lordship in your life that is not God if you're not surrendering to Him. There's something else in your life that has power and lordship over you, and you must make up your decision. What are you going to do about that? I can't make that choice for you. You must. I love this verse that I'm closing with in Proverbs 23, 26. He says, my son, and yes, applies to daughters too, amen. My son, give me your heart. Give me your heart. That's an act of the will. And he will never make you do it. He says, give me your heart and let your eyes observe my law. Why do you think that in the Old Testament, they always wore the scriptures on their forehead, on their clothing, on the walls entering their house. They always had the scriptures, okay, the laws of Moses and stuff, where they could always see them and meditate on them. When we do that, it's easy to surrender. Because now you believe that that true and powerful living God is real and He's in charge of your life. And whatever I face today, Father, I thank you that it's in your hands. But you see, when we wake up in the morning and we forget about God because we're too busy with everything else, and let's be honest, it's happened to me before, it probably happens to you. You get up in the morning, you get your cup of coffee, your soda, whatever it is, you get your phone, oh, I'm just going to check Facebook for five minutes. Before you know it, you're gone to go to work. And God is sitting there in the privacy of your room, waiting and you left him behind. Surrender is a beautiful thing, but it requires our will to do so. God is saying to us, give me your everything and watch what I do with it. Whew. I mean, think about it. Give me your everything and watch what I do with it. He wants your sin. He wants your pride. He wants your fear. He, he wants everything you got. Don't keep it. Open it up to him. This is what salvation's all about, amen? This is about running to Him. That day that you accepted the gospel of Jesus Christ and you received salvation, that was a beautiful day. But now every day you must remember that day. You must remember the payment, that price that He paid on the cross for you. And daily walk in His ways. Man, trust me. Open every bedroom, every window, every door in your life to Jesus. Let him have total, complete rulership. Seek him first, each and every day. I'm sure if you read the Bible before, you remember the story of Mary and Martha when Jesus came to visit. And don't worry, we're wrapping it up in a second here. Martha was in the kitchen, busy, busy. And Martha was not doing anything sinful, okay? She was busy fixing everything, keeping the house clean, taking care of stuff. But Mary, oh, <laughs> Mary was sitting at the feet of Jesus, soaking up the love of God. That's why we need more Marys. The kitchen will be taken care of later, don't worry. We need to sit at his feet and do surrender. Now, when was the last time you spent time like that with the Father? When was the last time you shut your eyes? And if you don't mind, close your eyes with me for a second. When was the last time you just closed your eyes knowing that he's present and you said, Father, oh, Lord, I need you. Thank you for salvation. Thank you for Jesus who died on that cross for me, Father. 
Father, I recognize that there's areas in my life that I don't, I, I'm not happy about. Some are shameful, Father. Some, it's just fear. You know, some is that, that I don't want to disappoint anybody. I, I, I want to be like I'm perfect. But I come to you now realizing, Father, that I'm broken. Just like my brother and my sister. And that's when we reach out to you and we say, we need your healing power. We surrender all to you. And let your will be done in my life as it is done in heaven. When was the last time you said that to the Lord? I hope today was not the first time. Whew. I'm going to open, open the front now. Listen, there's only one God here. There's only one Savior here. If you're here today and you heard the message and you are sitting there saying, Wow, man, that's pretty powerful stuff, but I don't think I'm saved. I don't think I, I'm, like you said, going to heaven. If that's you today, I just want you to slip your hand. Just as, as a way of us recognizing you and you recognizing us that you heard this message and that you're willing to accept the Lord as your Savior. If there's you here today, just slip your hand real quick. I'm not going to embarrass you. Anybody? All right, so I'm assuming then if the hands didn't go up that you're a believer. Amen. That you are a child of the Most High God. Pastor Johnny. You and your wife, come up, please. If you don't mind. Pastor. Ellen. If you want to have prayer of surrender today, listen, I want to invite you to come here today and surrender everything to the Lord. Amen. You don't have to tell us what it is. He knows. But come forward. Don't wait. Give it all to Jesus. On behalf of Pastor Randy and the entire staff at Everyday Church, we'd like to thank you for joining us today. For more information on the church, please visit us at everydaychurch.xyz.